everybody, welcome to On Church with Pastor Todd. Glad you're still here after uh, last week, or maybe you're here because of last week. I'm really glad to see you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just uh, scroll back and watch last week's sermon. From this series, what he said last week, what he said about the good news. Um, I'm really thankful to be able to preach in this context, the kind of sermon that will get you fired. Um, so hope that it's worth your time. Hope that you leave here encouraged. If you'd like to support this work, please become one of my patrons. I need many, many more. Patreon.com slash unchurched is where you can jump in to begin funding this work. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, send me an email, Todd Candelon at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share today's sermon with somebody who you know it will encourage. We are in a series called What He Said. We are looking at just the words of Jesus as contained in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And today, what he said about healing. I love this story. It's um, one of my favorites. Uh, honestly, I was uh, doing my best not to cry as I wrote it. We'll see how this goes. This is the story of the paralyzed dude and his four homies. And uh, in case you think it's weird that I would use the word homies, um, let me just say I'm a 90s kid and I make no apology for that fact. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 from the Voost translation. And having again entered Capernaum, after some days, he was heard of as being at home. And there were gathered together many, so that no longer was there room to receive them, not even at the door. And he was talking to them about the word. And they came bearing to him a paralytic who'd been picked up, and was being carried, carried by the four homies, <laughs> being carried by four men. And not being able to bring the paralytic to a place before him because of the crowd, they took off the surface of the roof where he was. Hallelujah. And having dug through, they lowered the pallet upon which the paralytic was lying prostrate. And having seen their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are put away. Now there were certain of the men learned in the sacred scriptures. This is the religious elite. Sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why is this fellow speaking in this manner? He is by contemptuous speech coming short of the reverence due to God. Who is able to put away sins except one person, God? Hmm. And immediately, Jesus, having become fully aware in his inner being that in this manner they were reasoning within themselves, says to them, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Which of the two is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are put away, or to say, be arising and pick up your pallet at once and carry it away and start walking and keep on walking? But in order that you may have absolute knowledge of the fact that the Son of Man possesses authority to forgive sins on the earth, he says to the paralytic, to you I say, be arising, pick up your pallet at once, and be going away into your home. And he, the paralytic, arose, and immediately having picked up his pallet, went out before all of them, so that all were astonished, and were glorifying God, saying, in this manner, never have we seen it. You see why I love Jesus so much? He's so great. He's so, so, I mean, he's so, He's so awesome. Okay, first, I want you to notice that Jesus stops in the middle of his sermon to heal this guy. <laughs> How awesome is that? That's what he was doing, right? He's uh, at his house. It's not his house, but most people think it's the house of Peter. It's at Peter's house where Jesus lived during his time in Galilee. It's right on the water, right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. I would have lived there too. He literally could have walked out of his house it's no more than 40 yards to uh, the seaside. I'm sure he jumped in for morning dip. Beautiful spot. Word gets around that he's home. Crowd shows up. So what does he do? He invites as many as he can into the house in which he was staying, and he begins to preach to them the word. He begins to preach to them about the good news. Hallelujah, the good news that we talked about last week. 
He interrupts his sermon, though, to heal this guy. I just want to say, I believe he'd do the same for you. You are more important to Jesus than an uninterrupted sermon. He does this throughout his ministry, constantly letting kids interrupt him, constantly letting the unwashed and the unclean approach him. I can't wait to get into these stories. And he heals this guy. You cannot miss when you study the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that what made Jesus famous was his prowess as a faith healer. This is difficult in our culture because most of us don't believe in miracles. And most of us don't think that any of this really happened. So you really got to struggle with that. I don't know what else to say. Like there's, <laughs> there's no way to read around it. <laughs> the only reason we don't think about it very much is we don't spend a lot of time um, preaching or teaching or studying these stories. But as I hope we'll do throughout this series, I mean, if you look at it straight, you can't look away from it. He is always healing the sick. In fact, he often heals all the sick that are brought to him on a given day in a given region. And he was so famous as a faith healer that literally thousands upon thousands of people were cascading into Northern Galilee where he lived and worked from everywhere around. <coughs> so desperate were they to have the faith healer from Galilee touch them or their loved ones with his healing power. So what does Jesus say about healing? First thing he says in this context as a healer is that you are accepted as his child. Verse five, child, hallelujah, your sins are put away. I mean, that's worth the price of admission right there. He calls you son, he calls you daughter. If you're wondering how to relate to God, this is one of the great miracles of the Jesus story, that in Jesus, God comes near. So they called him Emmanuel, with us God. That in Jesus, God comes near. That he stoops to our level, that he enters into our very human experience. Fully God and fully man. And this God, framer of the worlds, relates to this paralytic guy as a father relates to his child. Child. Your sins are put away. Don't you love your kids? Wouldn't you do anything for your kids? It is tremendously reassuring to frame the God of the universe in the picture of Jesus, who calls us child. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family. <laughs> that might heal you right there. Knowing that in Jesus, you are welcome to the family. There's room for you. If there was room for a paralytic who had to be let down through the roof, there's room for you. Welcome to the family. That'll heal you. So will, um, <clears throat> knowing what the real problem is, <laughs> still in verse 5, the second part, child, your sins are put away. I love this. Your sins are put away. They're put away. I want you to notice here that Jesus goes right to the issue. What is the issue here? Well, the issue is his paralysis. No, the issue is sin. So weird, right? We tend to hate on the religious elite. I do a lot. I'll do it a lot through this series. I'll try to make as little apology as possible. But I bet you if I was there, I can easily see myself thinking the same thing. What's, what's he talking about? Sin. The guy can't walk, Jesus. Open your eyes. Can't you see the real problem? Do you ever feel like God's overlooking the real problem? The reason you feel like God is overlooking the real problem is because you see the problem from your perspective, not his. Whoa, that'll preach. <laughs> Work with me here. There's at least a chance that he sees it different than you. And if he is who he says he is, whose perspective are we going to take? His or yours? Right. His. So it's just striking here 
That Jesus sees sin as the problem. Child, your sins are put away. Okay, why is sin the issue? What does Jesus say about healing? He says sin is the issue. Why is sin the issue? Because sin broke the world. Sin broke the world. Jesus for sure knew the story of Adam and Eve. Knew the story of their fall into sin and rebellion through disobedience to God's one clear command to leave the tree of the knowledge of good and evil alone. You can eat from all the trees in the garden, but that one you must not eat of. Lest in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Sure enough, what's the one thing they do? They eat from that forbidden tree. And in that disobedience, in that rebellion, sin is born in the heart of man. And from that day to this, all of us deal with what theologians call a sin nature. It's a bit more modern to call it a sin problem. You and I have a sin problem. And what does sin do? It breaks the world. It's a matter of a few paragraphs before Cain is killing his brother Abel. Okay, they've been east of the Garden of Eden for hardly any time at all before the first murder is committed. And from that moment on, the human story is really a litany of woes. As sin rears its ugly head and destroys people's lives. If you need healing, you need to recognize that you have a sin problem. You have a sin problem. You're thinking, well, wait, so someone gets cancer because of their sin? Stay with me in this series. We'll actually get to a story where one of the religious leaders asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? So stay tuned, we'll answer that question. But Jesus sees a sin problem here at the root. What is sin, you ask? Sin, the original word, is hamartion. It means to miss the mark, missing. So if that's what sin means, to miss the mark, missing, I don't think it's stretching it to say that you, if you're not all the way there yet on this whole Jesus tip, you can think of sin as misalignment. You can think of sin as being out of sync with the universe. You can think of sin as being disconnected from the divine force that rules the earth and the cosmos and everything that is. Look, if you're a staunch materialist, then all of this is balderdash to you. I'm surprised you're still here. Maybe you're still here because you know that sin is real. Why? Because people have sinned against you so much that though you want to say you don't believe in it, you know from your own experience that sin is real because people have missed the mark constantly in their relationships with you, in your business dealings, in your social sphere. You have experienced sin firsthand, and if you have any honesty in you at all, you know that you have committed sin firsthand. You have missed the mark in how you've related to others. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Simply put, none of us measure up. All of us have a sin problem, hamartion, we all miss the mark. Newsflash, nobody likes hearing this. Nobody. It's offensive, especially to someone who's seeking out healing. It's offensive, or could be seen as offensive, that Jesus focuses on sin here. And it caused some grumbling. Look at verses six through seven. These guys are sitting there, certain learned men in the sacred scriptures sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why is this fellow speaking in this manner? He is by contemptuous speech coming short of the reverence due to God. Who is able to put away sins except one person, God? This is a gotcha moment. <laughs> Who does he think he is? Jesus caused and Jesus rightly preached causes and Jesus rightly followed causes grumbling amongst religious people. He just does. Who does he think he is? Well, he thinks he's God. <laughs> they almost say it for him. No one can forgive sins except God alone. <laughs> Jesus is like, exactly. How do we know he's like exactly? 
because of verses eight through 12. And immediately, Jesus, having become fully aware in his inner being that in this manner they were reasoning within themselves, says to them, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Which of the two is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are put away, or to say, be arising, pick up your pallet at once and carry it away and start walking and keep on walking? Which is easier? But in order that you may have absolute knowledge of the fact that the Son of Man possesses authority to forgive sins on the earth, he says to the paralytic, to you I say, be arising, pick up your pallet at once and be going away into your house. And the paralytic does just that. Hallelujah. How do we know that Jesus thinks he's God? Because he knows what they're thinking. I don't know about you, but I never know what anyone is thinking. I often make a guess. I often feel a certain way. But most of the time I'm wrong, and so are you. Not Jesus, though. He knows what they are thinking. He knows what they're thinking, and he cuts right to the chase. Which of the two is easier? To say to this one, your sins are forgiven, your sins are put away, or take up your pallet, walk of this, blah, 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 which is easier? Well, obviously, it's easier, it would have been easier just to say your sins are forgiven. It's easier, that's the quicker of the two, your sins are forgiven. He is in the middle of a sermon, after all. <laughs> I, I love this about Jesus, he, he cuts right to the chase. He's so direct. And I love that he has authority. Oh, I love this about Jesus. But, in order that you may have absolute knowledge of the fact that the Son of Man possesses authority to forgive sins on the earth. Verse 10. It's like, the simplest thing for me to say to this man is that his sins are put away. But, just to shut you up, he uses his authority. Be arising. Pick up your pallet at once. And be going away into your house. Can I, uh, will you give me the liberty here to interpret this prophetically? I'm gonna do so. Notice that Jesus uses his authority here to heal this young man whom he has called child. Remember that one. He has authority and he uses it. And I believe the same is true for you and me that he has authority in your life and that he is using it. Not just he will use it, not just he has used it, he is using it. I believe the day will come when you look back on this season of your life that you're in and you will see how he was using his authority in your life, though you did not see it at the time. Somebody say amen. He has authority and he uses his authority. He says to this young man, be arising. This is the most important, the singular point of this sermon. And with this, I close. You want the key to healing? There it is right there in plain text, clear as mud. Be arising. If you want to be healed, whoa, somebody shout. Keep getting back up. And next week, what he said about worldliness. Worldliness.